Amen. Good morning. Thank you, guys. Do you believe in the personal existence of Satan? That doesn't wake you up this morning. I don't know what will. Think about it for a moment. Do you believe in the personal existence of the evil one? I think there's two extremes when contemplating the personal existence of Satan. Philip Ryken helps us better understand these two extremes. The First extreme is to minimize Satan's importance by failing to recognize that he has real spiritual power. Satan, also biblically known as the devil, the tempter, the evil one, the prince of demons, the dragon, the ancient serpent, the accuser, and so on in Scripture, would want nothing more than for us to minimize or even dismiss his power as mere hocus pocus. Satan is a deceiver, and he wants us to believe that he doesn't exist. He wants us to think of him as some silly character, maybe like this or something maybe you've imagined. As C.S. Lewis puts it in his popular book, The Screwtape Letters, which by the way is a great book to look at if you have any question of the existence of evil and the evil one. In that book he writes this though, One of the devil's favorite temptations is to tempt us to disbelieve in his existence so he can go about his affairs unnoticed. Ignoring Satan's existence is foolish. Now hear me out. I'm not claiming that there is a demon behind everything that goes wrong. But as one writer puts it, while we shouldn't think that there is a demon behind every bush, Demons are, in fact, behind some bushes. This leads us to the second extreme when contemplating the personal existence of the evil one, and that is to exaggerate his importance. Becoming spellbound by his sinister schemes, if you will. This response is typically driven by fear, and it leads us to believe that there's no hope in resisting the evil one, and there's no chance of victory. And some of you may be there. Well, as you'll see this morning, I pray, there is hope against the evil one. And the evil one does exist. And we need a healthy biblical view of the spiritual battles that are going on around us. For listen closely, while the outcome of the war has already been decided, God wins. Real battles are still going on. Real battles for your life for your relationships, for your marriage, for your children, for your integrity? Are you starting to begin to see the battles that exist around us? They're there. Well, for those of you who are unaware, here at Epic, currently we are in a sermon series that we're calling Bringing Heaven to Earth. And I think as we talk about this, understanding of the spiritual battles and the temptations around us, I think it's important for us to see this broken and fallen world is in need of some heaven. Amen? And so as we begin to contemplate this idea and begin to look deeper into the spiritual battles around us, I want you to see that we are in this series bringing heaven to earth. In fact, we've only got a couple weeks left, this week and next to be exact. And what we're doing is we're looking at the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer, is probably a better way to say it. It's a prayer from the Lord, but to His disciples. For us. And the more you look at this prayer, the more you realize it's not just words we say, it's also information, knowledge, truth about who God is, who we are, and how we are to relate to Him. But it's also the beginning of an intimate relationship of how we can commune with our Heavenly Father. And so this prayer is about bringing heaven to earth in our lives, in our homes, in our church, and in our world. And if you've missed any of this series, I encourage you, there are some wonderful truths that you can have a chance to really process and think about. Check out our website. We have 
uh, a spot for our sermons there that you can, you can catch up on some of these things. But this morning, I want our attention to turn towards the spiritual battles that we face every day. And if you have your Bibles, grab them. Let's turn right to Matthew 6. The Sermon on the Mount, right in the hub of what's happening with our relationship with God. Right in the center, we see the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer. And here we come to verse 13. Matthew 6, verse 13. The words will be on the screen as well. God's Word says this, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. This final petition, there's six of them, this final petition found in this prayer addresses the temptations and the battles that we face every day. The word used here for temptation, by the way, also means test or trial, depending on the context. You see, the difference in the two is that temptation is an enticement to get to a person to go contrary to God's will, while a test tries to get a person to prove themselves faithful to God's will, and all along with the purpose of them passing. Let me show you an example where both of these understandings are seen. Look in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, and you'll see that Jesus was tested by God, but He was tempted by Satan. Now, our current context, I think it's safe to say that temptation is the clear option since we're being delivered from the evil one, the next line that you see. And yet, if, 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 even if this is the case, even if we know we're dealing with the temptation against the evil one, not just some test or trial from God, We still have to ask ourselves a question because this is a bit puzzling. At least it is for me. Look, why are we asking God not to lead us into temptation if we know and believe He never tempts us? Is that not strange? Well, Grant Osborne explains this. This cannot be a prayer asking God not to do something that we already know know He does not do. Let me say that again. This cannot be a prayer that asks God to not do something that we know He already doesn't do. Lead us into temptation. He doesn't do it. God never tempts anyone to do evil. James 1, beginning with verse 13. Look at this. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin, when full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Mm. It's important for us to see, God never tempts us. All evil is inspired by the evil one. Instead, this final petition, instead of asking God to do something that we already know He doesn't do, instead, what we're asking when we look closely here at do not lead us into temptation, what we're hearing, or excuse me, what we're asking and pleading before our Heavenly Father is to save us when we are tempted by the evil one. We're saying, don't let us be overcome. We're saying, protect us from being drawn into sin. We're saying, keep us from succumbing to the evil one. We're saying, give us strength. We're saying, Don't lead us into situations where we will be overcome with evil. And I don't know about you, but when you're on the precipice and you're on the edge of walking in the cliff of being this close to the enticement or to to the deceptions and the lies of this world and the evil one and even our selfishness when it's right before you, I don't know about you, but all of a sudden this becomes very much a plea that needs to be a claiming plea. That we cry out in the name of Jesus, the beautiful name of Jesus, the powerful name of Jesus. Keep us from being overcome. Now, this doesn't mean that our temptations are some, somehow outside of God's control or that He hopes that we fail. He doesn't just say, Go into the valley of the shadows of death. Good luck. It's a part of life. He's with us. He's present with us. And He is powerful to provide and to strengthen and to surround us with His protection. 
He promises that. As one writer puts it, God may not always keep us from being tempted, but He can keep us from falling under temptation's power. Let me say that again. God may not always keep us from being tempted, but He can keep us from falling under temptation's power. And that's why this part of the prayer is needed. And we must never forget, look at 1 Corinthians 10.13. You need to put this promise in your back pocket. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. When the lies say you're not going to be able to overcome You need to claim the fact that God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But you've never been tempted like I have. Don't listen to the lies. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out. These are wonderful promises to claim. Because I don't know about you, but let's be honest for a second. That habitual activity of sin, that that snare that has you caught, do you ever feel like There's no way of defeating this. There's no way of breaking the cycle. There's no way of overcoming. There is a way. It is possible. That's good news. Look closer at this second element of this petition. It's not a separate prayer. We don't just say, do not lead us into temptation, but look at the full plea here. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. As you look closer here, notice how this portion of the plea is kind of the flip side of don't lead us into situations where we're going to be overcome by evil. It's the, it's the flip side because now we're, we're saying specifically, deliver us now. Don't just uh, help us avoid and, and be aware of the traps and the pitfalls. But deliver us. We're joining the pleas of the Egyptians we're joining the pleas of the early Christians crying out to wake up and know that there's an evil one prowling around that we need to be delivered from. Now, the personalized form here in, uh, of, of evil one versus evil is one that we should look at for a moment. Because evil and the evil one are, are virtually synonymous. Some of your translations of you, as you were reading may say, lead us not into uh, temptation, deliver us from evil. Others, evil one. And the reason I think it's important for us to see that we have a lean towards the evil one is because there is a personalized form here. As you look at Jesus' life, you see all throughout, He names what is in front of Him. The Satan. And so as we think about this, here's how I will simply put it. Evil is a disorganized kingdom of darkness. And Satan is its leader. And so however you want to put your thumb on it, there is evil in this world. And the evil one is the one that we must be delivered from. Amen? Next, look at deliver. Deliver, I think you will probably understand as a save. It means to save us from. And it carries this idea of both protection and removal from the situation. From one's power. And so this final petition is asking this. Listen closely. It's asking our Father for strength and deliverance. How many of you need strength and deliverance in your battles right now? One writer sums it up this way. We must be conscious that life is a spiritual battle. And we must rely on God not only for physical sustenance and forgiveness of sins, but also for moral triumph and spiritual victory in all the spiritual battles of life. So not only do we have to ask God to keep us from evil, but we also have to ask Him to rescue us from evil when we find ourselves in the midst of it. When we find it facing us head on. And I don't know about you, but that is a daily struggle for me. There are battles going on every day. So what does all this mean for us? We want to be strengthened and we want to be delivered. But what does this mean for us today? Well, I want to to highlight a couple truths that I hope will help aid us as we desire to be strengthened and delivered. Look at these. First off, I think it's important that we understand that the evil one is deadly. Let's not kid ourselves. 
Temptation is real and powerful. The evil one is strong. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's persistent, relentless, and looking for any sign of weakness. He's cunning, crafty, and much more. We cannot kid ourselves. The evil one is deadly. Can I get testimony of anyone else that knows that truth? We must remember the evil one is deadly. Second, we are weak. This is a good thing to understand. We're broken and needy sinners. We're foolish, we're prone to wonder, and we're prone to fall because no one can withstand temptation on their own accord. Did you hear that? Temptation's too dangerous for us to handle on our own. We need an intervention. And that's why we plea, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Look at the third truth to grasp when fighting temptation. Not only is the evil one deadly and we are weak, but God is strong. God is our deliverer. He's our rescuer, our redeemer. He's our protector, our loving father. And we must never forget that he is the victor. The victory has already been won. We just have to claim it. Thanks be to God. In fact, that leads us to our our last truth that I want you to see, and that is we are to claim and walk in God's victory. We can be strengthened and we can be delivered. For all of you today rolling your eyes saying you don't know the depths of where I am. You don't know how wrapped around this struggle I am. I don't. But there's one who intercedes on our behalf that does. That's what Hebrews tells us. God is the victor and He tells us to walk in that victory. To claim that victory. He will never leave nor forsake us. And while the evil one's powerful and while we are weak, God is stronger still. And we must claim and walk in His victory. How? <laughs> You ever ask that question? I mean, it's wonderful. Yes, okay, the evil one's deadly. We're weak. God is strong. And we must claim that victory. Where do we start? Sounds great. I can't tell you exactly what claiming this victory and walking this victory is going to look like for you exactly, but I can tell you a few things. I can tell you that overcoming temptation always includes the Spirit, God's Word, and daily prayer. If God's Word is not a part of you and in your heart, not just something you read and cross off your list, if it is not a part of who you are and the lamp unto your feet, you will stumble. If the Holy Spirit is not one you cry out for, you will fall. And this prayer, this final plea, it's a great place to start. When you're, when you're in that situation and you're like, I've got all these things coming in my head and I don't think they're all from me and there's just all these voices and all these lies and you just want to scream, sometimes you just need to say, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me. It's that heavy. It's that real. Lord, have mercy. Whatever it is, let these words come from our mouths. You know, Natalie and I, we find ourselves, my wife, saying this prayer numerous times a day. Ask our kiddos. They know this prayer. And I don't say that because we're super spiritual and my three-year-old can say this prayer. I say this because every day I'm in the car, I need the power, grace, and deliverance of Jesus. I have to. I can't go on without it. We're desperate for God's power and victory if we want to walk and claim the freedom that He's offered us. We are more than conquerors because of the One who loves us. I can also tell you that overcoming temptation involves not only the Spirit, God's Word, and prayer, but it involves a genuine repentance. It involves confession. And man, confession, as difficult as it is, it is so freeing. Have you ever been there? Have you ever done it? And it's contagious. I don't know about you, but as a, as a pastor, I have a chance to hear people a lot of times come and just spill their guts. You guys. And, and it's, it's inspiring. While in your mind you're thinking, I can't do this, there's too much pressure here, I will be known. 
it breaks down barriers and allows us to experience freedom. A genuine repentance, confession, accountability, wise counsel. We seek wise counsel in our daily lives for business decisions, financial decisions, you name it. But when it comes to spiritual decisions, nope, got this. Not true. We need each other. So what's your struggle? You know, it's funny because as I begin to share, I know that there's already things probably spinning around our heads as to what our struggles and battles are. And they're, they're oftentimes quite different for all of us. But as you think about these temptations and the battles that you're facing, I want you to ask this question, how am I to respond? Look at James 4, 7-10. through It says this, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. Mm. There are promises we have to claim. We need the Spirit. We need the Word. We need prayer on our lips daily. Repentance is involved. Confession is involved. Accountability and wise counsel. And listen, at this time of the service, we have often a chance to just respond. But listen, there's no way we can respond to the depths of the ways we need to respond this morning. There's no way we can just have a full-blown heart-to-heart, if you will. But we can do two things this morning. There's two things I want us to do. I want you to process this. I want you to pray about it. You're not going to be forced. Relax. But here's two things I want us to do in a time of response. First, I want us to take some time to repent. Quit letting this weigh your life and your heart down. Some of you might even need to turn in a moment and kneel in your prayer and just ask for God's forgiveness. You know, I want to make a few people available in case someone needs to pray, but between you and your Father, He loves you. And He wants to hear your heart. He knows your struggles and He wants to set you free. Others of you need to know that God has forgiven you. Did you hear that? Some of you need to accept that. You need to understand that God has forgiven you and that you are forgiven. So you are to go and sin no more. Accept God's grace. Not just for a moment. Walk in His grace and His mercy every day. Some of us need to quit living in shame and guilt. The evil one doesn't just bring us down. He causes us to think we're worthless and unlovable. We need to stop trying to contain and manage our sin. Did you hear me? You cannot contain and manage your sin. Instead, we need to claim and walk in God's victory. Our church wants to help. That's why community is also a part of it. What can we do? We can come alongside you as best we can to point you to God, to His Word, to speak wisdom, to listen, and to help you fight. Not only do I want us in in just a second to have a time of repentance, but also a time of commitment. How many times have you had these moments where... You feel convicted or you, you know that there's a battle and, and you know there's God stirring in your heart and you, you think and reflect, but you never are able to act. This is where I want you to commit. Commit to claiming and walking in God's victory. Whatever it takes, no excuses. Know what your next step is. Some of you need to confess to someone. Others, you need to commit to setting up boundaries. Committing to learn how to fight better the schemes of the evil one. Commit to seek accountability. I don't know what it is. As dreadful as that sounds, is it really heavier than the sin you're struggling with? There's no way. It 
rots away at your life. It robs you of joy and it robs you of intimacy. Don't delay and know what the next step is to fight the battles in your life. And we want to help. Will you repent and commit to do whatever it takes to resist the evil one and to come near to your loving Father? He's waiting on us. Your Father loves you and He wants what's best. I want to ask the band to come up. And as they do, will you stand with me? And as you stand, I know this is a heavy thing to process, but take some time to repent. Take some time to commit that you will claim and walk in the victory of Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father, I thank You so much for Your love for us. You are good and You are great. You have won the victory. You provide for us. You forgive us. You protect us. And You want to strengthen us and allow us to live in Your victory. I ask that that would be true of our lives. And when we're prone to wonder, may You redirect with Your Spirit, Your Word. And with intimacy with You. God, You are... You are stronger still. And all God's people said. I'm going to ask a few folks that are leaders who I've asked before, if you'll just slip out to the side. But will you take a time in this moment to reflect, to repent, and to commit?